So tonight we're going to talk about the Alvin Ailey uh, uh, winter season at City Center and some of the new works that are premiering. Um, we're very fortunate to have Robert Battle and Jamar Roberts and Donald Byrd and Stephanie Batten Bland. So I think we should just get started talking about these new works. I'd love to introduce Jamar Roberts, the new uh, choreographer in residence at Alvin Ailey. And um, please come up. and also Robert Battle, the artistic director of the company. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. So, <laughs> um, let's talk about this fall season. First of all, we've got, you've got a new choreographer in residence, which yes. is, I believe, the first time other than the original yes. choreographer in residence. Yes. Well, hello, everybody. Um, hi. Um, yes, we do. Uh, but in some ways, it's just a part, it's a continuum. I mean, Alvin Ailey, of course, uh, made this a repertory company so that he could support the choreographers who perhaps didn't have their own companies or just give them a platform. So it's always been about that kind of largesse. Um, I'm basically putting a title to it, right? Right. Um, in the way that Alvin Ailey supported uh, Ulysses Doves, and I think of many different choreographers. Uh, but when I saw this man in the studio, um, when he was making his first work for the company, Members Don't Get Weary, um, I, for one, as a member, was not weary when I was <laughs> seeing what he was doing in that studio. Uh, his use of music, his sensitivity, all reminded me of myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> did I mention genius? Um, but anyway, anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> anyway, that I really, there was something in me that felt protective of what I was seeing in his voice, in his sensitivity, and knowing um, that he was on that precipice where lots of people would see that and want a piece of it, which is great. Uh, but I also wanted to find another way to sort of help him, if you will, cultivate his own voice right. by giving him a safe place to create on dancers that he knew, on a place that he knew uh, that loved him, and it was reciprocal. And so in that way, it was kind of giving him shelter in a way to say whatever it is that he needs to say over time. Why did you decide that now was the time that Alvin Ailey needed that? Well, what changed? I, yeah, yeah. Nothing really. It's actually something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, and then it just seemed right. The uh, right person. The right person. Right. The right from moment. From within. From within. Um, you know, ballet companies have been doing that yeah. for a while, you know, resident choreographers. And I thought, why not us? <laughs> and, but it was more so of seeing his work and remembering for myself when I first started to make work. Sometimes you make that first good dance and then, wow, you know, you're sort of on this roller coaster, which is wonderful. But in some ways, I think I was thinking, God, what would I have wanted? Right. right? And in a way, it was to kind of have a place where I could slow down, you know? I mean, David Parsons did it for me. Uh, Parsons dance company I danced with, and then I was one of the first to, other than David Parsons, choreograph on the company, which I did for a few years, which is how Sylvia, Wa Sylvia Waters, who was the director of Ailey II, saw my work, and then Judith right. Janus and so on, blah, 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 here I am. <laughs> but it was great because for those years with Parsons, I had the dancers at the ready, and it was sort of a safe space, so that when I went out into the world to work with other companies, I really, felt that that helped me sort of get right, my grounding. Right. For you, Jamar, what, what was this um, experience like to be, to have, uh, to have this kind of vote of confidence in your work? And for, I mean, at what point do you feel you are in your choreographic sort of process? Have you, have you been making dances for a long time? Yeah, I've been making dances in some way, shape, or form since I was 16 years old, I would say. Um, where do I feel I am now? I think um, 
I put in my, what is it, 10,000 hours? So you, you know, were I, ready. You were yeah, ready when he came calling. Yeah, 100% calling. ready. So when the opportunity came, I didn't really feel unprepared. I wasn't scared. I kind of felt like it was, it felt right for me. And how is it different? I'm always curious about this. I mean, you're a dancer. You've been a dancer for a long time. Is it a different part of you that, um, that you tap into when you choreograph? Or is it an extension of your dancing imagination? I, I think it's an extension of it. I mean, I, I have to dance. I have to physically do it myself a lot of times in order to really get the, the right feelings that I want to have for the pieces. And, um, yeah, it's just an extension. It's it's just like for me, it's 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 almost like putting a magnifying glass on uh, the dancing that I already do, and sort of sort of figuring out, okay, if the arm goes up, for example, why is the arm going up? You know, and really really going deeper into to what moves the dance and like what is the the undercurrent that sort of supports. The dancing, it's like I have to sort of start to build those things rather than focusing on moving my body. Right. And as a dancer who choreographs, when you dance other people's work, does your choreographic imagination m sort of make changes in your mind? Do you imagine a different way of doing things? No, I think that there's freedom in dancing other people's yeah. work because I, I didn't you don't make have it. To. So I can just sit back and enjoy the ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where do you get inspiration from? Are you, do you think in images, or is it um, um, things that happen that resonate in you, or is it more from music? Um, for me, it's mainly from music and from literature. Mm. Um, I love writings of all kinds, mostly, and it's only because those things really stir the pot. They sort of mm. like stir this this well of like emotions for me, and it really gets the conversation started for you know, whichever one is sort of on the surface at that time when I have to go in the studio. So it sort of starts with an idea, and then a, you a find feeling, the music? A feeling, a feeling. And then an idea, and then music, mm -hmm. if I had to mm -hmm. give it an order. So your first piece for the company was Members Don't Get Weary. Um, it was a beautiful piece set to Coltrane. Thank you. What did you think when you first saw this piece? Did you know he had it in him? I knew. You knew. Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> you know everything. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. Um, you know, because I'm a good spy. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing things and mm -hmm. seeing this one thing you had on online on Facebook or something where you were blog in, on, improvising. Online. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was you were paying following attention. him. Yeah, and then he did his first work for the second company, Ailey Two, and. So I knew it was time, and I knew that it that something needed to come out. I have to say one thing though yeah. about, you know, there are choreographers who, like Keith just mentioned, he has to dance it, and then there are choreographers like me who'd rather not. Um, <laughs> not doing half the stuff I make people do, but was it always like that though? It was always like that. Oh, yeah? I was much, it, it, you know, but the hard thing as a dancer when you work with a choreographer who can do everything that they're asking, because sometimes as dancers if a choreographer asks us to do something that we think is impossible, we say, oh, I don't know if that'll work, right? But then when they actually show it working, <laughs> you got no cover. Yeah. You say, I just did it, now do it. <laughs> so it's amazing, it's yeah. amazing to watch. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I guess we should see the first excerpt, which is a little bit from Members Don't Get Weary. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, Members Don't Get Weary was a piece that, um, the inception of the piece sort of happened during a very, tumultuous time in the country and also for me it was a black men were being shot in the street it was the the beginning of the last presidential election was like in full swing and it just really felt like like there was just a lot of energy pent up there like within the country and also within my my own self and I knew that I had to go and make this work and I knew it was my first work and I was thinking of the company and Alvin and um, and it made me think of Alvin's first work. I think it was Blues Sweet, right? And so I decided to go on a theme of blues because I definitely had a case of the blues considering all <laughs> that was going on. Mm -hmm. And I sort of just um, thought of the blues and the birth of the blues and then that went into jazz which came out of blues and I chose uh, John Coltrane as the music score. Um, and really the piece is just kind of a, a, a a wash of, of 
so many different uh, feelings of mine. Sometimes you have feelings of, of uh, male, female kind of relationships. You know, when you hear in old blues songs, like my, my baby left me, like mm -hmm. these things. I was playing around with those types of lyrics. Um, there, I was thinking of images of, of uh, husbands being out at, at war, you know, and the, and the mother is being home but with loneliness, with so many themes that can really come into play when you're talking about the blues. What we're about to see now is, um, gosh, we're coming into the piece like more than halfway through. Um, but it definitely goes into uh, one of the major duets and which leads into a solo at the end of this little snippet here that um, for me was sort of like the pinnacle of, of everything that I was trying to say. There's a lot of power in it, but it's sort of contained within one, one body at the very end, you'll see here. Um, Who's going to so, be dancing? Oh, it's danced by Gray DeVore. Um, that's the soloist, but there are other dancers involved. Dancers, why don't you come out? <laughs> come on out. Here you are. I'm going to have them say their names for you. Just go ahead and tell the people your name. Hi, everyone. My name is Yannick Lebrun. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Green. Good evening. I'm Solomon Dumas. I'm Michael Jackson. Shalvar Montero. Jacqueline Harris. Gray Devore Stokes. Danica Palos. Jaroa Bomb Bozeman. I just think it's really important to <laughs> thank you. I think it's really important that they be acknowledged and that they actually have a voice, <laughs> like, <laughs> like literally have a voice, just because the work they do is so, it's so wonderful and it, they put, ugh, when I say it's work, it's, it's, it's a lot of work and we do it all the time, it's our lives and um, I'm very grateful to have worked with these dancers um, for, gosh, it was my second piece now, I think they were all in members and now they're all in the piece that I'm working in now, so, um, okay, you get ready? <laughs>
Thank you, dancers. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Of course, it's missing the scenic elements, which are a huge part of the, of the dance. And we're going to talk a little bit more about scenic elements now with your team for Ode. Yeah. Um, hey, team. Come on over, Brandon and Libby Stadstad. Brandon Sterling Baker, Libby Stadstad. So, uh, so uh, members don't get weary. Had this very blue palette, which came uh, a lot came from the light, right? That Brandon. Did you talk about that in advance, or was that something that happened organically as the piece was evolving? We talked about it in advance. I am <laughs> have this, I've had this obsession with blue for a very long time, so I knew that I just wanted to wear it out for this piece, and I wanted to be uh, very literal with the blues theme, especially when it came to the aesthetic. And so I said, Brandon, take it away. Yeah. <laughs> and you designed the costumes, I did. both for that piece and for this piece. Yes. Um, and they had kind of a period feel, if I remember. Um, I wouldn't say a period feel. I was trying to capture the feeling of, of everyday working class people, um, specifically for members especially. So the new piece is called Ode, and it's premiering on December 10th, if I'm not mistaken. You're absolutely right. Um, and so tell us a little bit about it and about how the aesthetic of the piece kind of started to develop. Um, well, the aesthetic of the piece started from the theme of the piece. Uh, the, the piece conceptually is a, is a poem. It's an ode to innocent victims of, of gun violence. And my way in to this topic was not to, you know, stress out the theme of, of, of death, but actually to go in through love and compassion and empathy, especially for the families that, uh, that no longer have you know, these people with them anymore. And so um, there's an over, I mean, I think the, <laughs> sorry, the, there's so many, so many elements and like threats, feelings and a thoughts lot of kind threats, of wrapped up right? into this, but the, when speaking of scenic elements and, and lighting, um, there's a very heavy floral theme here. I wanted the piece to be uh, a flower on the grave of these victims. And so I wanted to use that theme in terms of set, and I also wanted to use that in the aesthetic of the costumes. So the flower idea came from, came from you, from your sort of yes. brainstorming about the mm -hmm. piece. So Brandon, you did the lights, and Libby, you did the, the scenic design. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us a little bit, both of you, how, you know, what were the first steps that got you to, we're going to see some of the designs in a minute. Yeah. Um, sort of how did that, those ideas, Libby, you can start. Um, well, like Jamar said, he presented the, the idea of um, a flower to the victims, the innocent victims of gun violence. And um, we started looking at some initial um, sculpt, flower sculptures. You know, um, yeah, I just threw a bunch of images at her. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like, we should put this. one of yeah. the slides up let's so we know what. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yes, so thank you. Uh, so this is some of the initial concepts. Um, it's kind of like my brainstorming sketches that um, I used as a tool when I first started talking with Jamar. Um, so the question is, I mean, a flower could be anything, you know, it could be one flower on the ground, it could be flowers that they're dancing in, or it could be something more ethereal and above their heads. Um, something that brings you into a space somewhere between life and death. I mean, it could be anything that you want to derive from, from these. But um, you can see it's kind of just playing with composition and how it re also relates to, I have like little figures and, and just trying to see like, what story that's going to tell, um, and also like, you know, how much of that story we need to tell? Because you can see we have like flower palooza up there on the right hand mm -hmm. side, and then realizing that less is more, and and a small gesture can mean a lot more than a big one. So from the beginning, you were already sort of thinking about light. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I mean, Libby can show it in the next slide too. I think yeah. the. Um, the thing I love so much about what Jamar was saying is that he wanted it to be this world that was not this like stark, uh, violent space, but something that actually still, in all of the horror, still has a lot of beauty. And so a lot of the lighting, the presence of light in this, in this new ballet is to find this new world that's not quite um, the afterlife and not quite present life. It's like this somewhere, this otherworldly experience that is full of love and full of spirit 
and a lot of the inspiration for the color has deeply come from the, the flower uh, constellation that, that Libby has sort of come up with. Yeah. So how does the music fit in with all of this? Maybe you, Jamar, like the, the piece is Don Pullen's Sweet Malcolm, which is a very striking piece. Yeah. Um, at first, the music selection, I, I knew that I wanted to strip down all the instruments that uh, Coltrane used, <laughs> and I just wanted to use one singular uh, piano solo score. So I used Don Pullen's score, mostly because of the first note. The first note is one singular note, but it has so much power, and it has, it pretty much has the entire essence of the piece is sort of uh, uh, heard in this one note. Um, but it also goes off into sort of a, it has a ABA type structure to the music, so it starts off really beautiful. And a lot of the themes and like sort of the phrase work that's built around that theme are in life. A lot of the phrase work that's built around the middle section is about death and despair. And then the third section is um, uh, the afterlife or, mm -hmm. or, or resolution. Um, that middle part is actually really, really complex, sort of challenging music. I wanted the music to reflect um, in, in the same way when you hear about a tragic story of, of someone being shot, do you know what I mean? Like, what feeling does that resonate with you? You know, it's, it's disturbing and it's, it's really hard to take and I wanted the audience to have that sort of visceral experience and this music sort of has that space for that and also has the space for the other, the more loving side. Are there more slides or is this the last slide? There's a middle slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh wow. So th are these some of your sources of inspiration for the flowers? Yeah. Um, so yes, this is this is actually what I submitted to our um, our fabricators, our scene shop. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a it's a flower by flower layout. So each like each element is very specifically laid out to create our constellation. And then next to it is the inspiration pictures that they created individual flowers from that compose. Are those paintings, or are they? Or those are. It's a mixture of paintings and real flowers. I feel like the top one is at the Met, right? Yes. <laughs> I think it's, there's a I, puzzle based on that one. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, yes. <laughs> I've done that puzzle. Um, that's so interesting. And mm -hmm. um, the beauty of the flowers, um, and the, it, what is the material? Is it sort of translucent plastic or? It's glass? actually, it's um, muslin. It's a natural oh, fiber. Yeah. Um, and then they're painted with um, dye. Uh -huh. And it is translucent, so when Brandon backlights it, they'll, have, they'll right. glow. Um, so as Jamar was describing the music, that it has these very different um, feelings from one section to the next. How did you work with that with the lighting? What, what was cool is the source material for him was inspired by an ode or, or literature, and so is I, we organized the light in the same way he organized the choreography. It was like by each stanza, the three stanzas have their own visual uh, landscape with the light. And so the first opening image is this sort of otherworldly uh, glow from the flowers from above, and we never see the floor ever. So just floating bodies in space. And the second stanza, which is sort of like the peak or like the hurricane almost in the music, it's out of control and all of the light comes from beyond the space and from upstage of the flowers, so all the light shines through it. And then the, the final uh, stanza, the final movement, uh, returns to where we, where we began, mm -hmm. to something that's a little serene but at peace. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about stanzas, there isn't an actual text, is there? There's not an actual text, but I've created one through, <laughs> through <laughs> movement. Uh -huh. um, so it is structured in the same form as a traditional literary ode. So mm -hmm. there are three stanzas, um, uh, life, death, and afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, and I just sort of used, um, speaking of the death part, the middle part specifically, I didn't want to over-dramatize or, or have too many affects that sort of signify you know, pain or death or too many movements that sort of you know, literally show this type of suffering. So what I did was, I wanted to strip that down as much as I can. So instead of um, maybe grabbing my fists like this, I sort of like took the energy of that and maybe made three steps out of mm -hmm. that energy, which mm -hmm. then turns into, I don't know, maybe arm down, arm up, and a look. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like I sort of wanted to 
because the music is already <laughs> aggressive enough, mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to sort of tone that part down a little bit. Right. But I consider a lot of the moves uh, within this work more adjectives than anything. They're just adjectives. Sort of, yeah, just sort of describing an experience or mm. words that are describing a space. Right. Oh, interesting. So you've pretty much just finished creating it, Pretty right? much just yeah. finished. Just so we're going to see a little <laughs> excerpt, right? Yeah. And um, are you going to work with the dancers just a little bit? I'll do a little something, yeah. OK, sure. cool. So tell us a little bit about what we're going to see. What you will see is the beginning of the first stanza. It's basically the beginning of the piece. We will not go all the way through that stanza, but um, there are two casts for this piece. There's a cast of men, and there's a female cast. Um, and you will see the male cast here tonight. Hey guys, wanna come out and play? <laughs> um, so we have here again Yannick, Ronaldo, Shalvar, Jeroboam, Michael Jackson, and Solomon. So this is the beginning of the piece. Um, a lot of the phrase work in this part of the stanza is definitely centered around life. So it's very expansive. It's very, uh, very open. There's a lot of chest going forward and up. And I was really thinking of elevation and also trying to capture the, the general beauty of the music. Um, architecturally, it's very simple. There's just two lines, essentially. And they just kind of sway back and forth in a very simple and a beautiful way to contrast the stanza that comes after this, which you will not see. You'll have to come to the season to see that one. Um, so um, here we go. Can I have uh, Ronaldo and Jeroboam stay on the stage, please? <laughs> Catch your breath, nice. So going back to what I was talking about when I was speaking of the steps actually being adjectives for me, in the stanza after this one, we sort of go into a deeper space. And the movement vocabulary kind of shifts from something what you saw just now into something that's a bit more angular and a bit more jagged. Um, the dancers are sort of moving from more of a space of, of, of activism and from anger and from 
um, sort of a deeper, a deeper space in general, where the movement kind of, instead of it floating outward, it's actually really uh, terse and really, really tense on the inside, and it kind of shoots in a way that, um, that really has, has an end, almost as if it's, if it's uh, assaulting somebody <laughs> sometimes, it's what, it's what it feels like. So Ronaldo, can you do me a favor and sort of uh, go into a phrase that I call the complex phrase and sort of just do it as if um, the music is actually on, so just with full Go. Go. And rest. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, there is a moment in the piece where a lot of the material is sort of as, as quick and sort of as sharp as you saw here, but Jeroboam's character for me represents uh, hope. So no matter how sort of deep into despair we go, I kind of created this sort of uh, noun, if you will, <laughs> that sort of embodies uh, hope in the midst of despair. So if you kind of go into the beginning of that solo, just alone, it's just sort of against the, a lot of the angles that you just saw here with Ronaldo in the center, there is this ever-present sort of lightness that I wanted to sort of carry uh, the piece from the hard point all the way until the end. Easy, easier, easier. Easy, 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 easy. And rest. Good, 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 good. So. <laughs> good. So ordinarily, there would be, I think there are probably what, five, five dancers around this guy, but I just want to sort of overlap these two phrases just so that you get an idea of the, just the general energetic shift that sort of matches the, the themes for each stanza. So go ahead and try and be a little bit closer than you normally would be. Um, and we're going to add some music to this. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Score. <laughs> thank you, guys. It's so interesting to see the overlap, how th the overlapping of the two phrases kind of adds to both. Yeah, I think the conversation had to be the hard part, <laughs> one of the hard parts of choreographing to this music is that I had to 
sort of for each phrase or I had to create a different uh, theme in my mind, but all to the same music. So it was really fun to see them all sort of um, play out in the same space, completely different, but still catching on to the right, same music right. and, and really holding on to the musicality. Right. Well, let's bring on Donald Byrd, who's also making a new piece for the season, and Stephanie Batten-Bland, who has also worked with Ailey too and um, made a piece at the Choreographic Lab. Jamar, you stay for a little, <laughs> a little longer. Hello, <laughs> welcome. Welcome. So Donald, you're making a new piece for the season called Greenwood, is that right? That's correct. Um, talk a little bit about it. Well, uh, Greenwood was inspired by the Tulsa massacre, uh, which often, as you said, we were talking earlier, you refer to it as a riot. And well, it's I, known in the history book I know, as I mean, Tulsa yeah, race but I, let me explain yeah. why, why I'm yeah. saying this, not to kind of put you on blast or call you out or anything. <laughs> uh, but, but that's how most people think of it. And my thinking about it was that it was in fact a massacre. And I said, as I said to you, if it, were, it was a riot, it was really about white people rioting, yeah. not about black people. But usually when you say riot, we automatically think it means black people right. doing something. And so, uh, so it was inspired uh, by that as a kind of telling of that narrative, that story. And Greenwood refers to the neighborhood, uh, the black neighborhood, which was very prosperous and it was known historically as Black Wall Street at the time. And so the, the, the piece basically is about the, the destruction of Greenwood. It was really raised. To it was down. raised, yeah. it was bombed and raised. Yeah. Um, what, what made you, what drew you to the story? Why did you think it could be told through dance? Right, well, well I, I hope it can be told through <laughs> dance. Uh, what drew me to it was, I mean, recently I've been doing a, a lot of work that's about uh, kind of recovering history, you might say, black history, uh, especially some of the horrible things that have been done to black people, and not with the intention of making people feel bad, but really just so that there's some awareness and consciousness about it, about this history. And so uh, last season, for example, with my company in Seattle, I did a piece that was about lynchings, and, uh, and so it's about just kind of bringing it to, the con to our consciousness so that, it, it, that we have, as a society, as a culture, that we are aware of all aspects of our history. Right. And so that's what really drew, drew me to it. Because some of these events are, they're sort of something you read about in a history book. Mm -hmm. It's called the Tulsa Race Riots. And right. then we don't know that much ab about it. Right. They, these things get kind of buried under our, under our voluminous history. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know if they, it gets buried, it gets, uh, often it's just erased. Covered, it con yeah. con consciously it, that it's erased. Purposefully. Purposefully yeah. it's erased, yeah. 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 And Stephanie, you created a piece um, at the Choreographic Lab um, that was also on, on a social theme. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So. Um, what a joy to be a part of a lab that allows one to just dive in and, and, and dive into data building and, and research making. And the lab uh, allowed me an opportunity to prepare for a piece that I was going to be um, making. In, for your own company, right? No, this is for Yuri Sands. Oh, for Yuri Sands. And for Tony Pierce, two amazing members of the Alvin Ailey organization that went and began their own company called Two Dance. Um, and amidst an amazing amount of, let's say, need of healing, um, not unlike what we're kind of talking about up here, are we talking about erasing, are we talking about uh, personally ne neglecting or forgetting, um, I was interested in wondering how we could help one another heal. I quite notice when I offer someone to shake my hand well, there's a lot of reaction towards that. I mean, I'm a person of what I am, and perhaps they might be afraid, afraid to, to get into contact with my skin, with myself, with me. And often objects allow us to uh, break this barrier. Hey, could you help me hold this? 
right? It can bring us towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. So in the lab, working with students um, that were themselves a part of an enormous amount of instability in their own lives as to how they themselves were dealing with gun violence within their own homes and within the places that they had come to and now here they were in New York City. I wanted to approach this research from a place of sound. And how can we through sound um, not just embody and find punctuations sonically through sound and physically through ourselves movement wise, but we started working with paper. And if I may use your paper just for a moment, I asked us all to do this. Just for the sound qualities? Yes. And this brought up um, horrific reactions. And once we got past the horror of these reactions, we actually started finding that thousands of these sounds put together can be rain. Rain ensues eventually that the sun's going to come back out which allows a place of healing and comfort to take place. So with these papers and with this research, we allowed ourselves to not just take uh, sound, but also to use chalk and to trace not just ourselves, but to trace those that perhaps we've, we no longer see and miss and those that we hope this never happens to. Um, and thanks to the lab research, uh, we were able to create a series of um, paper creations that we carry through different communities and audience members help us bring them on stage. So there, it had an installation aspect to it as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, what was the name of the piece and, and what was the specific uh, spark behind sure. it? Sure. Um, I guess in, my, uh, in myself I was trying to think of what was the first what was the first death that I recalled and that made me get up and, and stand outside and made me start thinking of um, how was my brother coming home that night? And um, for me, it was Amadou, and it was the 41 times. Amadou Diallo. Yes, yeah. because the f that, that is a phenomenal number, 41. I mean, shot I just hit it home, a while right? ago, right? But yeah, shot. Unarmed. Oh, yes, just coming At home. home. Just, yes, well, just, yes. yeah. Um, and that number is... That was amazing. That was amazing for us to be able to recreate what does the number 41 sound like? What does 41 sound like within ourselves when we're numerous amounts of people? And what does the multitude of that sound just ricochet throughout us physically as well as just sonically? Right, right. Jamar, f for your new piece, Ode, um, there was also sort of a real, a real world um, inspiration to it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, for me, it was just sort of... Uh, I just thinking of my family, I think, just in hearing of all of those cases, the number one thing I would think about is my brother, is my mother, and then myself. I think that's largely the reason why I have a cast of all men as my first cast, is because it could, it could happen to me, it could happen to anyone. Um, Donald, since your piece is premiering, um, what music are you using and how does it fit in with the theme of the piece? Right, uh, the music that I'm using, it's, it's a little different than I, I think how I usually use music or even think of music. Uh, I think the driving, I know, not I think, that I know that the driving force behind it really is the sound score. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds, so there's sound that's been invented to do certain things. But the primary music is by uh, an Israeli uh, composer, Emmanuel uh, Vitzchum, that I met when I was, I had a residency in Jerusalem in 2011. And I met him there and I did some work with him there and then I uh, did some work in Seattle with him and then recently, a, a piece just closed on Sunday, I did a piece for uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet that he did the music for. So we used uh, snippets of music that he had composed for this piece and it kind of comes in and out. Uh, and then uh, there's also field recordings from Alan Lomax that, uh, that he did down in the south in the 20s, the teens and the 20s of church music. Uh, I think that what you're seeing tonight, I don't think any of that is in there. It's mostly Emmanuel's music and so some of the sound. So there's some found sound. There's some, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know if Stuff I would call it Stuff taken from the real, from the real world. Well, yes. No, if, Yeah, no, if, I'm just, I mean, it's just, to me, it just, I mean, it sounds, it sounds a little bit kind of like 
the Europeans found America. You know, right. I mean, and, you right. know, it's kind yeah, of in no, that yeah, world yeah, of yeah. things. You yeah. know what I mean? But it's not something composed by someone for you for this piece. No, but it was composed by someone, right. but just by black people down south. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Collectively. Right. And um, are those recordings, that, is it all together in a sound score that you've put together? No, it just, it come, there are certain sections where it's there, and some, mostly where it is is stuff in churches mm -hmm. where people are, are singing. Mm -hmm. And do you start from, with the music, or do you make some of the movement without the music? I usually start from an idea, like mm -hmm. what, what's the, what do I want to say, what am I after, what, I'm, what do I want to investigate, what, uh, uh, and, and what's uh, what challenge what might challenge me inside of that but it's usually the the idea is something that is, is really where that where I begin what's the idea and how can I take that idea into a physicalized uh, uh, mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. so what are we gonna see now and do you want to set it up a little bit yeah okay so what we're gonna see is, okay so one of the things about the the the, the Tulsa uh, uh, massacre was what caused it. So what we know is that a young man named Dick Rollins walked into a building uh, and there was an elevator. He got into the elevator that was run by a young white woman. While they were in the elevator, she screamed and he ran away. That's all we really know. And so what I one of the things that I do in the piece is like I kind of, what are the different interpretations of that? Because there are are uh, interpretations that have kind of evolved over time and even at the time. Some say that he molested her, others, uh, one other is that he just walked in, stepped on her toe and she screamed, and then another was that they actually had, they were in some sort of relationship and uh, he stepped, he did something and it frightened her and she screamed. So what you're gonna see is the duet that suggests that they actually knew each other and were in a relationship. So are there actually different versions within the dance That's itself? That's different versions, yes. Oh, wow, okay. So um, before we see this final excerpt, I just want to thank everyone at Works in Process, and I want to thank Robert Battle, and I want to thank Jamar, and I want to thank Ronald, and I want to thank Stephanie, and I want to thank Brandon and Libby and all of you. So on to the next excerpt.